Welcome to the Fuel Pulse Show podcast, where we talk about all things fuel for all kinds of people. Here on the Fuel Pulse Show podcast, we like to talk about issues and problems and solutions for all the different kinds of fuel that you may be using either on the job in a professional capacity or at home. Um, and so that means the Fuel Pulse Show podcast is really for everybody. And today we are talking with friend of the pod, Brian Hartley, and he is the owner of Diesel Dialysis up in uh, Cinnamon Sun, New Jersey. Uh, yes, yes, I, I say that five it. times fast and to see if you get it. So <laughs> uh, Brian spent, I don't know, the first 25 years or so of his career in the Paragen sector. Yep. And so from his experiences there and then his experiences with generators and fuel tanks, you know, he's really seen firsthand uh, how lack of fuel maintenance can really affect how people are able to get business done. And we like talking to Brian because uh, he's really good at giving everyone an inside perspective on the whole sector of you know fuel polishing. And Brian really knows what he's talking about mm. when it comes to things like, you know, what's important about fuel polishing, what it can do, uh, even what its limitations are. And he's not afraid to let his customers know what's going on uh, so that they can make the right decisions for themselves. And, you know, that's the kind of person you want to do business with. And that's the kind of person that we like to talk to here because makes him really makes him one of the good guys in the industry, if I can put it that way. Yeah. So, uh, Let's let's talk about something that is a pretty important uh, element of what you do, and that has to do with the fuel quality uh, in you know in stored fuel tanks. Um, and you know, from mm -hmm. our end, where we deal primarily with the chemistries, you know, we're uh, pretty familiar with how you know different mm -hmm. chemistries, like you know, like the biocides that we talked about, or like stabilizers, you know, how important they are. And the role that they play yep. in protecting, you know, stored fuel quality over a period of time. Um, and I know you've got perspectives on uh, other areas uh, that are definitely worth talking about that really do matter. Um, you know, when you talk about some of the fittings and the components, the filters, but also even the things like tank design. So like, you know, single wall versus double wall. For sure. Um, you know, I, I think you mentioned before that there are jobs where, you know, tell us about, you know, how that, how the tank design factors in, especially for some of the jobs that you've done uh, before. Oh, for sure. So, um, you know, the tank, the tank design itself um, really comes into play on how you maintain it. Um, so, you know, if we just use uh, above, above ground tanks as an example, um, there's a big difference on how you handle a, a base mm -hmm. tank underneath of a generator versus a, uh, a standalone storage tank that's off to the side. And is that standalone tank, is it a round yep. tank, is it a square tank, is it a silo tank? They all have different challenges on how you um, approach fuel quality. So, you know, so quality of that fuel um, is dependent on, obviously we have an, the additive side and the chemistry side of things, but in order to, to make those things work well, is the tank in a area or a setup in a nature that will allow those additives mm -hmm. to do their job? Or are we leaking water into a tank? Are we, are, are, is the tank vented properly? Or do we have if you're having microbial yeah. issues in your tank, um, I, I like to go one step further of not just saying, well, we're going to treat it with a biocide mm -hmm. and filter it. Yes, those are all things that treat your symptoms. But yes. how did we get this microbial problem to begin with? And the answer is there's water getting into the tank. There's moisture getting into the tank. There's some way that it is mm -hmm. being affected by the outside world. Um, so we like to take an approach of looking at these tanks and trying to get them. Um, I think I've used this example before the rolling up the window, right? You, you buy a new car, you bring it to your, in your driveway. You don't leave it sitting outside with the windows down. Uh, we're, we're trying to, you roll them up. So you protect the inside of the car. We're trying to do the same with the fuel, um, proper emergency venting, proper 
ceiling of uh, alarms mm -hmm. and or you know there's a lot of sensors and things in the tank, making sure uh, fittings are uh, installed with proper caulking. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen tanks that were installed no pipe dope ah. on the threads, <laughs> just installed. Well, because it's just a vent pipe. What do we need thread? What do we need pipe dope for? It's not sealing anything. Well, it's ah. sealing water out of the tank. Things like that. Um, we're big with changing out emergency vents with yeah, different yeah. Let's styles talk about that. Of um, vents. You know, uh, so that I, I get the sense that may be something that the typical you know operations manager, you know, maybe they know that that there are some important differences in some of the different, let's say, some of the designs, or that there are basically good mm -hmm. emergency vent types of emergency vents to use, and there are not so good. So. And this is something I understand that mm. you see all the time and that you can make recommendations. So talk a little bit about what you see and why that matters and then what you tell people about that. Yeah. So, so your typical, like, uh, let's, let's talk about it because mm -hmm. I come from the generator world and this is, this is mainly geared towards that whole generator world with all and standby power and stored yeah. fuel for that application. Uh, the generator tanks generally, when they arrive, uh, especially the smaller, uh, mm -hmm. less expensive units, to be in that competitive market, they're, they cut corners sure. on different devices, um, mm -hmm. gauges, um, and emergency venting. So emergency vents, they, you'll see a lot of them where there'll be just a spring-loaded emergency vent with a steel plate on the top and, okay. a, and a rubber seal. Pretty yeah. common in the generator world. If that type of a gauge or, or that type of a vent is used outside on uh -huh. a unit sitting in the rain, you're going to end up with water in your tank because those seals are exposed to the temperature changes, the sun beating down on them. It deteriorates the rubber and so those would be okay for leak, maybe inside. You're relying, like you said, when you're outside. Yeah, you know, if I, if they're we, we okay. call them indoor use only. If they're okay. inside of a unit, I'm fine with leaving it. It serves its purpose. It's, it's, it's doing the emergency yep. venting of the tank. It's fine. But it, if it's getting exposed to elements outside, mm -hmm. rain, snow, water, they need to be a different style. Um, we gear a, a lot towards yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Morrison brand. Their, their emergency venting, they have their newer, the newer yeah, yeah, 244 yeah. and 245 emergency mm -hmm. vents. They have a really big lid on it. So what they did was they oversized the lid yep. to put a... Uh, a drip edge so when rain and water hit the top of it it runs off the side and it's not mm -hmm. contacting the ceiling surface so underneath of that yep. lid is an o-ring the o-ring is what does your ceiling but if you have an emergency vent that your o-ring is the mm -hmm. primary defense well when the o-ring yes. fails you have water in your tank so on in, in those style in the other style vents is why we kind of gear towards the morrison's uh, the O-ring is not your primary defense. The, the, the design of the, the cap edge. sheds the water from hitting the seal. Yes. Mm -hmm. So water never hits the seal to begin with. If the seal fails, you're still not getting water in your tank because of the, the, the design. So we, we really do gear towards a lot of that. Um, same thing mm -hmm. with fill ports. You're going to yeah. see it and, and yep. vents, uh, tank vents. Um, yeah, a, a lot of that. If we have an updraft mm -hmm. style vent, we call them rain funnels because when it rains, uh -huh. all they do is funnel rain right into your tank. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of we're, we're big fans of putting uh, vent systems on filter systems. But at the very least, mm -hmm. a mushroom yeah, cap yeah. is going to do a whole lot better than an yeah, updraft style cap, vent. Um, you know, from from the picture that folks will see is it, it's called a mushroom cap vent because it's kind of like that. Whereas the rain yes, catcher one is over top. Like yes, yes. So the air would have to go underneath to go mm -hmm. turn and go into the tank. Uh, that's a better style. When you have driving rain coming in from the side, it can't mm -hmm. go down, up, and down. I mean, is so there it's a, a better cost style? You know, whether um, it's these style events or these, uh, you know, the the the, the, the emergency you know. vents. You know, like the Morrisons versus the the spring, you know, the, the ones with the springs. Is there a big substantial <coughs> cost difference uh, between them? In the in the big yeah. picture, uh, no, it's 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 really peanuts. So the in the emergency vent world, um, you know, some of those as we call them, the indoor yeah. rated vents, um, 
50 or 60 bucks, whereas the Morrisons are going to run you 200, yeah. 250. But, but, you know, when you're talking about, uh, uh, you know, $50,000 yes. of diesel fuel, yeah. what, what's 200 bucks yeah. to protect your fuel? Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it's peanuts. Yeah, 200 in, bucks in the big to space. a regular person is a lot, but it's all about the scale. It's kind of like when we do work in like aviation, sure. and you talk about the cost of testing aviation fuel, uh, you know, it might cost a hundred bucks to do an aviation microbe test. Uh, you know, and a hundred bucks is a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. Someone might say, Oh, you know, I'd rather have a hundred bucks in my pocket. But sure. when you put that against, you know, on a private uh, uh, jet where the just just to take a wing off of a private jet to look inside and inspect it costs forty thousand dollars just to take it off. So a hundred bucks, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's peanut. And it's same not, for that. Same yeah. for this. So one hundred fifty dollar difference. Yeah, when you put it into perspective of that big picture, uh, it's really not a, a, a significant uh, change. Uh, you know, it's just being mindful of what to use and when yeah. to use them and how to use them. Um, you know, uh, we said we use we uh -huh. use fill ports as well. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the generator world they have um, you know yes. vented caps they call them. So you'll see them they're, they're turtle mm -hmm. they, they flop mm -hmm. open they flop closed. And they put a padlock on it. Those are they're vented. Mm -hmm. If you look underneath of it, there's ridges underneath right. it, so air can go in and out. Right. So we we want to we want to switch those out and put in a sealed vent or a sealed cap so that air that mm -hmm. goes in and out of your tank is is all goes yes. through your vent pipe, not through mm -hmm. not through the fill. Uh, and then you can then when you start getting into yep. vent and filter systems on your vent. Um, you're forcing all that vent air to go through your filter yeah. and not bypass it. Um, yep. Yep. And mm -hmm. same thing with gauges where we making sure you have a, what's called a okay. vapor tight gauge, uh, gaugings. If, if your gauges are not vapor tight, if your manufacturer does not have a vapor tight rating on it, okay, don't put it on your tank. Um, they're, they're, they're especially if it's outside, they're going to leak. Um, you know, we see a lot in the generator world. We see, uh, the the, mm -hmm. the Kruger mm -hmm. brand uh, gauges, listen, they're they're great. They work very well for their application for heating okay. oil tanks that are inside. They are not intended for a generator outside. But you find a I lot of them in those situations. You, you have a group, oh, hundreds of them. We throw them out. They every single one we get to. If it's more than a year or two old, they are mm -hmm. broken and leaking. The, the seals do not hold up, and they the mm -hmm. plastic cracks. It with the UV rays and they just and they're and so they're, you they're replace them leak. with a a a, a vapor tight kind of uh, of gauge. Yeah, we're, we're we're looking for different types of gauges that um you know there's lots of different brands there's lots of different manufacturers out there but we want one that is sealed mm -hmm. um and does not allow air or not allow water or vapors into. Now the you mentioned vent uh, uh filters uh earlier so. Um, yes. How, I was going to ask, mm -hmm. well, what's the role of the, the filter on the vent for the person who uh, doesn't have expert knowledge in this? Um, how can, uh, you know, what's the difference in this context? What's the difference between a good filter and a bad filter? So there's there's lots of different uh, versions and brands out there. Um, there, there's several types that have uh -huh. desiccant uh -huh. beads in them that change colors as, yep. you know, the, and they, they work well. Um, they remove a, a large amount, yep. you know, when air is going in and out of the tank, they're, yep. they're stripping moisture. Uh, and the moisture is what is causing that vapor yes. space corrosion. The, the area above your fuel in your tank, you know, you we yep. can probably put some pictures up of this, of corrosion on the bottom of a tank yeah. or on the underside of a yeah tank sealing these filters mm -hmm. strip moisture to help remove that um they also clean the air uh we use a lot of uh, uh -huh. donaldson product uh yeah. their trap vents so you know they're probably a little less effective in mm -hmm. stripping the moisture but they are um the life the service life of them okay. is longer 
So we can we can install those and get a year out of them. Whereas sometimes the the desiccant branded, mm-hmm. the desiccant type ones, you may only get three or six months out of them and have to replace them. So there's a, a repeat factor. So again, talking to your customer, what are their goals? What's ultimately their goal? How much do they want to spend? What's their budget? These are all mm-hmm. things that need to be from, discussed. From with them. the experiences you had with your customers, do are they familiar with the the operational life of these, like you said, three to six months versus a year, do they know, is it common knowledge that you can typically only get three to six months out of those uh, kind? No. And, and, and these are things you have to discuss with them, right? Um, um, if you're not, if you're not having those discussions with them, if they, if they think they're getting yeah. a year service out of it or two years of service out of it um, and you know, what's the point of putting the filter on and the desiccant on there if it's if it's depleted mm-hmm. in three months and you uh, and it needs to be replaced and they think they're going to go a year so it's not really helping you anymore so yeah. just be mindful of, of what that what that is there's different brands and different brands different types of stuff and you just have to be mindful of what type mm-hmm. of a tank you're putting it on as well single wall tanks double wall yeah. tanks or these ul tanks do they have do they have emergency venting uh if you're doing if you're doing a filter system mm-hmm. on an underground tank uh, you need to have, um, you know, pressure relief valves uh, for for in case mm-hmm. those filters are neglected and and um, you know the tank can still vent air through through a, a bypass valve, not just the filter. So yeah, and so be, what, once be you pass, let's say you have one of these three to six month uh, uh, filters. Once you pass that six month and it's no longer working the way that it should is the primary thing that you're going to see basically more water build up uh, or is it going to be increased that sure. combined with uh, greater chances or greater instances of that vapor space corrosion it's 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 that's what it, it's greater chance of having that uh, vapor space corrosion um, you know it's I, I'm always an advocate for doing this stuff brand yep. new when the tanks are new that's when you want to get to them if you're putting this on a tank that is mm-hmm. already 20 years old yeah. and already has corrosion, no, you're not. You're not going to no. fix the corrosion. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> right. But we can we can limit how much. Yeah, yeah. Further it goes, yeah. right? We're we're helping it to to, to slow oh. that down. I mean, trying to extend the life of that tank. Um, you know, again, that so that's the funny thing. Like fuel tanks, there there is no life no. expectancy of a tank. There's no manufacturer will tell you. Well, your your well, tank needs to be replaced dependent. in five years, so ten years, ten years. Dependent. Yeah, correct. Absolutely, it all yes. depends on the maintenance. Yes. Um, if you're if you are, and this is where um, you know the quote unquote mm-hmm. fuel polishers come in. Uh, if we we use fuel polishing as a tool to mm-hmm. mix the additives and filter out anything that could be um, yep. forming in that fuel. Uh, if generally, if we, you know, we know we're doing a good job because I go out to a site and, um, you know, I have several contracts where we're doing, you know, 50 or 100,000 gallons of diesel fuel and we're polishing and we're not mm-hmm. using any filters yep. <laughs> it's because our additives are working <laughs> and, and these bre- yes. breather systems are working. And, you know, that tells you that we're doing we're doing the correct job. We're doing well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned several times the whole issue of vapor space corrosion. And as soon as you mentioned that the first time, I remembered some things that we wrote. Now, it's probably going back three, four years now where we were introducing that uh, and talking about like the EPA uh, uh, study that they started in, I think it was 2010, where they were trying to get a a Mm -hmm. more systematic, rigorous uh, knowledge about how bad or how common vapor space corrosion was out, out in the industry. And I know they were going to do some yeah. follow-ups on that. Uh, I They may have already done so. I myself haven't seen the follow-ups. But uh, it sounds like uh, in your experience with your customers, you've seen plenty of instances of this vapor space corrosion. So oh, what, sure. what does that typically, where yeah, do you typically sure. see, um, and not this, I mean, vapor space corrosion means it's above, it's, it's above the fuel, fuel line, above the fuel. what are above the, the fuel. most yeah. common like parts that you see it on? What's, what are the, the most damaging instances that you've seen, uh, like whether it's on STPs or, or, or things like that? 
Yeah, well, we we see it a lot when you're when you're when you're going into a tank to mm -hmm. um, taking things apart, uh, doing an, an investigation or trying to find out what's going on with the tank. When you pull yeah. spare plugs, pulling emergency vents out, seeing you know a lot of the emergency yep. vents are aluminum. You're seeing a ton of corrosion under them, rust. Uh -huh. The screws that bolt the, the the bottom of the flange together, they may be rusted. And if you see all that, that tells you that's the same thing that's on the bottom side of your tank. You see, it's all over. Um, so that's mainly where you're seeing it on. And yes. uh, floats. Um, we see it on on floats. So a lot of this is where we where it becomes very mm -hmm. technical, or very uh, critical. Um, you know, you have a, a float for a fuel system that may have yep. five floats on it, right? You have your low fuel, a pump on, pump off, okay. a high fuel, and a critical high. Well, if the high fuel and critical high fuel floats are stuck because mm -hmm. their corrosion yep. built up on them and rust and and dirt or and things like that from that vapor space corrosion. Yes. Mm -hmm. They may not work. So, you know, I, I, I recently had yep. a site where this happened. Um, a, a, we had a, we had a spill, a customer lost 1800 gallons Ooh. of diesel fuel in a parking lot. And it was because of, floats that did not work in their high their high yeah. level floats were stuck and they didn't understand how they didn't work well ultimately what happened was their their pump okay. off float failed um and their their high fuel level floats were mm -hmm. stuck because of corrosion and they never stopped they never shut the pumps off and <laughs> vapor space corrosion caused it you know it's 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 crazy how much but do you it think happens it costs for them not just to replace 1800 gallons but to remediate the fact that it's spilled out into a parking lot. Uh, the oh, insurance geez. companies are still dealing with it. And that was a year and a half ago. They they have uh, monitoring wells mm -hmm. drilled in the facility, all around the facility. Yeah. Um, my guess is probably uh, several hundred thousand dollars in cleanup. Um, and that's not including the years and decades of Re, you know of remediation oh, yeah. that may need to be done in the yeah. future as they're yeah, watching yeah. monitoring remediation monitoring mm -hmm. yeah 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 people don't realize how yep. well i should say the average person doesn't realize that mm -hmm. there i'm sure there are plenty of operation managers who conceptually know that if they're oh, unlucky sure. enough to have two thousand gallons of fuel spill out it's going to be really expensive <laughs> which is why it's important it's going to be very expensive yep so, you know, and, and this is um, and it's, it's this is why we we try to gear yep. people towards using filters. There are other systems out there. Mm -hmm. um, we we're not really big mm -hmm. with using any of them yet in the generator world, but it's coming. It, um, uh, yeah. Nitrogen injection systems and now, dry I, air by systems. Nitrogen injection. Right? So, that's not the same thing as nitrogen blanket systems, is it? OK. Okay. Yeah, no, that's what I'm. That's what I'm talking about. Blanketing your blanketing yep. your tanks in nitrogen. Um, there are some people using mm -hmm. air dryers that are you know to blow dry, uh, humid, mm -hmm. you know, humidity free air over top of your fuel. It, it eliminates that vapor space corrosion. It helps with the quality of your fuel by mm -hmm. by keeping your fuel dry. And if your fuel is dry, you you don't have to worry about mm -hmm. the microbial side. As so much. Do, do you get? Oh, so these are all do things you get the that sense can be used. That uh, those kinds of systems are going to become more and more uh, commonly used and accepted uh, in the industry. I think so. I think you're. I think you're going to see more of them in the future. Um, you know, I, I I don't want to say that they're new systems because yeah. they're really not, but they're gaining uh, they're gaining traction in in facilities that have larger mm -hmm. amounts of fuel and. And, and and larger tanks because uh, I mean you think about this if you have a, a, a tank inside of a building built it was built before uh -huh. the building was built you uh -huh. really need to take care of that tank right because you no. can't replace no, it no. no you can't <laughs> so you're right so systems like that um, can help you in extending the life of that tank to 50 or a hundred years. Yeah, you can get that life out of if them. you take if care you of take them. Care well, of and them. another thing, talking about companies that are starting to adopt these is, you said larger companies. It's just the fact of life that larger companies yeah. uh, have more money to spend on these the these things. For sure. 
For sure, right? You, you know, your average your average uh, small company with you know maybe a three hundred gallon no. diesel tank underneath of their generator probably not going to install a a, a nitrogen blanket system no. on that tank, and it's no, probably no. not worth it for them. You know that, <laughs> but you know in these large in larger facilities and more expensive facilities, you know that can be mm-hmm. it can be worth it because it helps reduce those those things. Um, you know. But at the same time, uh, if you're not monitoring, you're not looking at the fuel, um, you know, you can still have tank failures yeah. because of that. Um, we, we, were, we were talking earlier about the, uh, the yep. Monday I was just on a job, uh, a standard 275-gallon UL80 yep. heating oil style tank for a customer. They have mm-hmm. it. It's in containment, uh, so which was good. And that's why I agreed to clean that. Um, they, they, the generator company found they're having some water yep. issues with their generator. So they called us in to clean the tank. Um, we did clean it and it was Swiss oh, cheese yes, underneath yes, it. Yes. That's uh, the one you were talking about. Yeah. Cause yes. you mentioned, you, you mentioned yes. about that one that, uh, yeah, you, you won't clean single wall tanks because of certain, uh, things. So, uh, I, I, I don't. Yeah. We have to be very careful about those. Very, very careful about them, you know, um, to, again, take each one uh, mm-hmm. uh, case by case. But um, it, uh, those UL80 mm-hmm. tanks are very thin. Uh, mm-hmm. There's not a lot of metal to them. If they have water and they've had bacteria in them for yeah, any yeah. significant time, they often yes. leak when yeah. you're done cleaning them. And uh, that, so... Yeah. Tank replacement. That's what we're into now. We're, we we just quoted them a, a whole new tank and a new installation. And, you know, you know, it, it's expensive because of where the tank is and just the labor to get a tank into there. And now we also mm-hmm. have to remove the old tank and get it out of the building. That is a lot. And this, lot. this company that had this single wall tank that where it was Swiss cheese on the bottom. So you agreed to clean it because you said it had containment. So yeah, so it was open, yep. open top containment. You know, the the tank sits inside mm-hmm. of a, a an yeah. outside tank, and so they were having yep. fuel leak into that. I assume they were having fuel leak into that that outer containment tank. Uh okay. so well, we caught it before we yep. put fuel back into the tank. So we knew after we cleaned it, we were having water from would, the pressure washers yeah, uh, leaking yeah. into the containment. The so we cleaning, could cleaning it yep, would, yep. was the final the final straw in compromising the integrity yes but if they hadn't cleaned it it was going to get compromised uh eventually sure they they were they were probably a mm. year from walking into that room and all the fuel yes, in the tank being in the container would not be... you know so we like to we like to you know again we we could be careful about what we yeah. talk about with, with that but cleaning the tank does not ruin the tank the tank yeah. was already compromised right so i already had holes in it Cleaning it just clean the rust and, right. and debris out of the holes. <laughs> so, right, right. You know, unfortunately, the damage yeah. was already done. There was nothing that we damage. could do to and, save it. And you know, now somebody right. could right. make the case. Well, you know, if we hadn't, if you hadn't cleaned it, then you wouldn't have compromised it. Well, but to what we said earlier, if you didn't, if you don't clean it and you don't get the microbes and all yeah. the, the you know the biomass and the other things out, it was eventually going to head down that road. So. Correct. And well, they and they already had a fuel system yep. failure on their engine because of fuel related issues. So, you know, you look at it from from the from the yep. aspect of maintenance. So instead of spending, you know, seven hundred and fifty dollars to a thousand dollars a year mm-hmm. on fuel maintenance, they spent ten thousand dollars on an engine repair. And now they're looking at, uh, you know, fifteen thousand yeah. dollars for a tank replacement. So. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. their engine's down. <laughs> so we actually had to we put a temporary tank in, in in the room. So uh we have a they still have fuel, but um mm-hmm. you know, it's uh they now have a rental tank in there and yeah, it's, you're it's talking a whole about lot involved. An, essentially a difference in uh, in ROI of twenty five yeah. to thirty to one, you know, thirty thousand dollars versus a thousand yeah. dollars. Uh in for sure. And it what what's upsetting is that it can be prevented. It does not need to do that. It, the only reason it happened is just because we nobody was paying attention to the fuel. Uh, we took the old adage of, uh, well, we put fuel in a tank. It's diesel fuel. It's <laughs> fine. It's good forever. Yeah. 
No, <laughs> not anymore. Unfortunately, it's not. No, 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 no. That's yeah. And this one, and this one was all because. And it's here's what's crazy about it. Mm -hmm. It's an inside tank. Tanks inside the building. How does that's it get water a good in it? question? Well, it's the. <laughs> It, you go go follow your vent pipes and your fill pipes. Uh, the vent has some turndowns on yeah. it, so no water getting in there. It was their fill cap. Um, they had a an older style flush mounted uh, heating oil mm -hmm. style cap um, that the gasket was missing from, and it wasn't tight. So uh, yeah. every time it rained, it leaked. You know, a little bit, a couple of drops yeah, of water, in every time it rains, and. Five years yeah. later, the tanks rotted out. Yeah. Now, um, yeah. you know, you said your 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 not practice, but your position is you don't clean single wall tanks unless they have containment. How common is is that is that mm -hmm. a common position among fuel polishers across the industry, or are you in the minority on that? Uh, I got to be honest with you. I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not really sure how many uh, fuel fuel mm -hmm. polisher yeah. quote polisher guys like me um, do yeah, tank cleanings. Um, the 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 few the few that I know that I talk to honestly, it's, <laughs> they'll they'll have to, I'll go and clean yeah. the tanks for them because I do it. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of systems built for doing that. I have uh, nozzle systems. Um, we do pressure washer water systems we also have i have diesel fuel mm -hmm. cleaning systems where we we use where we take fuel out of the tank and i use a um i i call it a high pressure sure. diesel wash but it's not really high uh -huh. pressure hundreds of psi you know yep. it might be 50 psi where we fire 50 psi yep. of fuel through a nozzle yes. to wash the tank and and rinse and you know but you got to do those on tanks yes. that can have that you know if it's just some minor sludge uh, some minor particulate laying on the bottom. We can get them with that. Uh, where we don't, if we can, if we can clean a tank without mm -hmm. introducing water into yeah. it, yeah. that's always better, right? So because we, we then we then we avoid a step of having to dry mm -hmm. the tank when we're done because that's another step. Once we clean a tank and pressure washing, yes. we have to dry yeah. the and, tank and as well. You're you're one of the, so. the the good ones that makes sure that your customer is knows what the limitations are and tempers the expectations um, because you, you talk about cleaning a tank out and you talk about tank designs, you know, it's really hard to get all or most of the, you know, if we'll call it, lump it all together and say sludge in particular out of a tank yeah. working from the outside without doing like man entry. And it's especially true if it's got like bathrooms, sure. things like that. It's oh, yeah. really hard. Well, yeah. I should, so we, we, yeah, we often will take uh, tanks that have baffles in them and well, we'll work with, a lot of times we'll work with the generator companies. So we do a lot of work yep. for those guys as well. Um, we'll, we'll work with them where we can, we'll actually unbolt mm -hmm. the units from the ground and tip them, okay. pick up one side to use gravity to our advantage to let everything run to one side or pick up on, on an end so that everything runs to one side where we can get in, in the back in this other fittings to wash that side of the tank. But we know that, we can wash all of the, the, the contaminants to one end where we can get to it. So we may not be able to get to it in this part, mm -hmm. but if we pick it up six inches, we can push it to that side and, where and we can get that, it. That's another thing that, so we'll that. Uh, people may not think of. You, you talked about access points earlier. The fact that for a lot of tanks, there, there's limitations to what you actually can physically get to. Lots. And Yeah. Yeah, I, ha I have one I'm going to be doing for uh, for one of the universities here in New Jersey um, next, uh, probably in like two weeks. They have a, yeah. it's a base tank, but it's a UL2085. Okay. So it's a, a you know, a fire, a flame guard style tank. So it's six inches thick in insulation all the way around the tank. Uh, the tank is probably uh, 30, okay. 35 feet long. Um, and then all the fuel went bad. And they have a layer of sounds like in the an tank. expensive proposition. Oh, I'm plus uh, all the baffles. <laughs> How do you get to all that? Well, the unfortunate answer is you, you probably can't get to most of it. Uh, you have mm -hmm. to put some uh, filter systems on. We're gonna we're, they're gonna upgrade their filter systems, their primary filters, uh, to make sure they don't get any 
sludge or anything up in the tank. We're going to do our best to, to, yeah. to flush the tank. Uh, we use this as not a tank cleaning. This is okay. called a flush because that's all we're doing, uh, flushing from one end to the other, try and get as much as we can out. But they got to be mindful of knowing that there is still stuff in that tank and, and they have to be able to uh, filter it before the engine. So they're going to upgrade. Yeah. And systems. so in a in in that kind of case where you're doing that kind of, of, of tank cleaning work, um, is there a mm -hmm. are there criteria for success uh, in that um, the customer can look will look for X and X indicates that the tank cleaner or the fuel polisher has done the job satisfactorily or maybe to frame, take a step back and frame it. So, what should, what should the customer yeah. look for if they engage the services of either a fuel polisher or a tank cleaner? What should they look for that determines if the job has been done correctly? So for us, we, we, okay. use, we use pictures of the tanks. We, we take pictures. Mm -hmm. I will put a camera in the tank. And okay. take pictures before and after, um, so that we can show them. But not everyone does what that, it looked though. like before and what. It, yeah. No, not everyone does. And honestly, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be real. Um, you know, mm -hmm. super elaborate. Um, honestly, most of the times, uh, you'd be surprised how good the oh, camera yeah. is on an iPhone. Yeah. Just stick yeah. it in the tank and take a picture. Just don't. Uh, that's it. that's really it. And we share those with <laughs> them. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I've done that too. <laughs> so. Um, but they do, you know, share those pictures with our customers to say, here's what, here's where you were, here's where you are after we're done. Um, and we can show you the improvements that we made. Um, we, we don't, we, we want them, not just yep. some written words that says, hey, we cleaned your tank. We want to show them what we did. Um, and then we will, we'll educate them and talk to them yep. about the vent systems. Uh, hey, we upgraded your emergency vent. And this is why, because they were leaking water in. So here's the old style. Here's the new style. We upgraded your your mm -hmm. your gauge because your gauge is a not a vapor tight gauge uh, and we started seeing a lot of this now um yep. we, we just had a snowfall snow laying on top of the tank and a gauge that is leaking guess where all that water goes as the snow melts right in the tank uh so yeah we, we you know we take pictures of these things and and share them so uh for the rest of this year um how do you foresee the rest of 2024 going? Is there anything that you know of the, that you can see coming down the pike that you would recommend, you know, fuel professionals and operation professionals to keep an eye out for, uh, you know, going forward the rest of this year? Uh, I don't think anything new. Um, it's really a lot of the, a lot of the same, um, we, you know, the, the fuels today with lower sulfur content are more susceptible to yeah. um, microbial. Um, so making sure your your tank systems are mm -hmm. protecting the fuel. Uh, you know, the tanks aren't there just to hold yes. the fuel. They're there to protect the fuel. Uh, so gear towards that. We, let, let's, let's get our systems in place so that we can make this fuel last longer. Um, using those additives and using polishing systems to, to help us uh, with that fuel quality. Um, for us, I see, I see a lot more tank cleanings in our future. Well, I could have told you that. <laughs> we, it, it's, I'll tell you what, listen, it's a whole lot easier to mm -hmm. clean a tank, put fresh fuel in, upgrade your systems, and then maintain it with polishing for the future, for the foreseeable future than it is to, Take a tank that is in bad shape and start polishing. Yes, you can get to a yeah. better place, but it takes years and years of re rounds of repeat polishing to get there. Um, so we've been we've been seeing a trend towards just clean my tank, start me fresh, and let's get well, on. And that's this interesting. You you you, so you raise that point about. Um, repeated rounds of fuel polishing that gets in. I don't think that's yeah. something that people really realize is if they don't take care of their their tank and their fuel from the start, then uh, you know not only are they gonna make, not only are they gonna have to fix the problem later, but it's gonna require more than one visit. Oh for sure. Absolutely. Um you know, you're going to, you're going to need repeat visits. Um, I think I may have used this analogy last time was the, the, the dentist, oh, uh, the yeah. analogy of going to the dentist, right? 
if you haven't been to the dentist in 15 years, you can go and get your teeth clean, but it's probably not going to solve all your problems. You can, you're going to need to keep going back every six months to, and getting cleanings and having somebody inspecting and checking and making sure you're yeah. going, you're moving in a, in a, in a direction of those better quality. Same thing with the fuel. If you just, if you just have a polishing, have a polisher do it one time and you don't see him again for two or three years, you, you just waste well, your it's money. And also the checking, which is something they can do, but yeah. not everybody does it. You have to check your fuel yeah, and keep track of its condition it's not a set it and forget it kind of thing yeah you know we monitor it with that sampling um and i think we've talked before about about yep. sampling practices um being sure you're sampling mm-hmm. correctly you know we we do not sample well i shouldn't say never we we have but you always try to sample from a vent yep. port not a fill port right fill ports is where your clean fuel goes in mm-hmm. pushes all dirt away you take a sample from there mm. oh it looks great everything's fantastic meanwhile well, the dirt's yeah. on the side of the tank so go to find your vent ports pull you gotta take something apart pull samples from mm-hmm. different parts of your tank and monitor it that way that's how you that's how you know if your fuel well, that's is, an important is, is point, going good and baselines too i i'm a rec I, i'm yep. always a big believer in baselines right if you get new fuel like a in a new tank, first thing you do, pull a sample, yeah. ship it to your lab, get a baseline so yes. you know where you are, know what's going on. Next year, when you pull another sample, you have something exactly. to compare to. You yeah. know what's yeah, going you, on. And as you keep doing this, you build a history of how the fuel condition yeah. changes in that tank. And so then you can start developing predictive uh, uh, models. Uh, you know, exactly. control intervals. It's it's exactly the same with mm-hmm. with engine maintenance, right? So everybody knows about the generators. They're you're we're pulling yes, oil and coolant samples most oftentimes mm-hmm. every quarter. Yeah. Right. And we use those why Checking to your trend, wear metals, to track like to see what's going on. Yep. Building a history. We should be doing the same thing with the fuel. Mm-hmm. Building a history uh, uh, at one year bare intervals minimum. is the bare minimum. Um, bare minimum, right? You in. You know, I'm not going to say a guy that has 300 gallons of diesel fuel should be running no. a $250 test every quarter. But, um, you know, if you have uh, 25,000 gallons of diesel fuel. worth your while. Uh, you know what? Once a year probably is not enough. You really should be trending yeah. and looking at this more twice, closely twice on a, a year regular is basis. Kind of, I think kind of the sweet spot. Quarterly, if you're really yeah. concerned. I don't think they need to do it more than quarterly. I mean, there does come a point where you're doing it too often. But, you know, two two times. Yeah. Four, if you really like, if you really like it, but you know, once, once That's extreme, I, I'm, I agree. Want to do two is the minimum, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I agree. All right. Well, uh, Brian, as as always, yep. uh, is are there any parting thoughts you want to uh, uh, have for the the listeners out there? I'm um, just thinking warm mm. thoughts, man. Spring's coming. Well, baseball I'm looking forward season to it. is coming, man. <laughs> no yes. more snow. No more yes. snow. Well, uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking time uh, to spend with us, uh, passing along some more of your expertise for for the folks. Um, I know that our audience always gets a a lot out of any time you have something to say. So appreciate you being here with us. Um, Appreciate you having me. Like I said, it's uh, no problem. You're not twisting my arm to come and talk about fuel. It's something I'm passionate about. We we love talking about it. We it's uh, you know. Uh, when you go to parties, I'm always the guy that's talking about diesel fuel. I, I've never been to a party <laughs> so, where somebody has uh, done that. But then again, I've never been to a party with you. So. <laughs> well, there you go. See, there you go. But, uh, you know, so I, I enjoyed it. It was, well, it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Here. And uh, that is going to do it, it for this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. As always, we're going to have uh, links to in the show notes to whatever things that we talked about. So check out the show notes for more information on all of the subjects that we hit on uh, in this episode. And also, uh, if you haven't done so already, feel free to subscribe to the Fuel Show podcast on your podcast platform of choice, whether that's iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, any of those. 
Um, and uh, as always, tell your friends and leave us a good rating if you're so inclined, because that really helps with the algorithms for helping people to find us. So uh, on behalf of Brian, uh, thank you again for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time for the next episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast.